Holding my chest. My legs and hands. Silence. Feeling the pressure. What? She was a fraud. It's a million bloody degrees out there. Oh, wind. I'm sorry if I said anything awful. Blessed lambs, of course. Why hadn't he got up to chop the capsicums? I was never a good reader. Ah, but immaculately bland. Anyway, it looks like... What do we do with this now? We're not even supposed to use the word fat. Boys like girls. When we were very young... I was back home in Norwich. Square Sound. You're listening to the audiobook podcast for the makers and listeners of audiobooks. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the audiobook podcast. I'm Justine Sloan Lees, and together with Abby Holmes, lovely to see you again. Good to see you too. We discuss what goes on behind the stories in the production of audiobooks. And today, our guest is Rupert Dagus. He's an extraordinary vocal artist who conducts his international career from his home studio in Sydney. So we'll be talking, amongst other things, about what it's like to work as narrator, director and sound engineer all rolled into one. Yes, there's no doubt that Rupert knows voice. He has narrated an extraordinary 250 audiobooks. For this, he's received 14 Golden Earphones Awards, has been nominated for a couple of Audis, and was named by Audiophile as Best Voice of the Year 2008 and 2009. He also won the Odyssey Award for Excellence in Audiobook Production. Rupert has provided voices for video games and animated films and series, including Bob the Builder, Blinky Bill, Chop Socky Chooks, Kitty is Not a Cat, and the upcoming Peter Rabbit 2. Occasionally, Rupert does venture out of a small darkened booth to work on film, TV and stage here and in the UK. And you can check out his eight-episode audio series, Grover's Mill, on iTunes, in which he and fellow voice actor Amy Horn play some 50 characters between them in a dark, and surreal true crime satire about a missing hairdresser, Orson Welles, and whether we really did land on the moon. Rupert, it's so great to have you with us, except you're not actually with us. You're in your home studio in Sydney and I'm in the square booth in Melbourne. Ah, uh-huh, booth to booth. The magic of technology. So tell us, how did you get into audiobooks? Well, it started because I was doing radio drama at the BBC I was given the opportunity to be in a multi-cast audio drama which was going to have the author, Philip Pullman, reading the narrative and then a cast of actors playing all the parts. We recorded that in London with Bill de Vries and Garrick Hagen from The Story Circle for co-production between Random House and the BBC. And it just kind of stemmed from there. Someone said, oh, you should get into doing single read audio. The first book I did was True History of the Kelly Gang by Peter Carey. Oh. Yes. There was a, an, a Kiwi actress in London called Nicolette McKenzie, and she was asked, do you know any Aussie actors, in Lon- young Aussie actors who can play young Ned Kelly? And she said, well, I, there aren't any, but there's this English guy who does this really awesome Aussie accent. So I kind of went in and met with them, and it quickly transpired that Ned Kelly would have had an Irish accent, and all the characters in the book would have had Scottish and Irish. But they wanted the actual narration of Ned Kelly to have a slight Aussie. I don't know why. But then I did that and um, it wasn't punctuated and they had to punctuate the whole book for me because Peter Carey wrote it without any punctuation. Mm. So they punctuated it and that was my first single read. And then I started working for Naxos and it just led from there really. So how did you perfect an Australian accent? Because it's notoriously hard, isn't it? I've always just done accents. I've always been doing accents all my life. I've just always lapped them up and uh, copied them. I've had Two Australian wives. <laughs> uh, it, it, yeah, I, it's, I don't know. Um, just do it, really. You know, it just comes out. <laughs> There's no technique. It's just kind of listen and repeat, rinse and repeat, you know. Yes. Now, I mentioned that you were in your studio in Sydney. You do a lot of work yourself there and just wanted to talk about the process of self-recording because I, my understanding is that in the States there's a bit of a trend that they like to have audiobook narrators record themselves. Obviously, you're cutting out a member of a team, so it's cheaper by not having a dedicated director slash sound engineer, but what's your 
you know about that and what's your experience of it? Well, it's funny you say cutting out a member of the team because you'll remember as well that, you know, in the old days, there were a sound engineer and a director mm. and a publisher and the narrator. There'd be four of us in a session. And so we've cutting out three members of the team now, not just one, which is a little sad. But, you know, like the printing press and Kodak and VHS tapes, every, things change, things progress. It all started out of necessity for me because I do a lot of voiceovers in the commercial world and promos and animation and cartoons and stuff. And I was finding that doing an audiobook is quite time committed. Yes. You have to do sort of four to eight hour full days sitting in the booth reading. My agent would be saying, well, you've got this job, the Coca-Cola commercial, or you've got a, this Bob the Builder thing, or you've got an audition for, for Holby City or whatever it is, because, you know, you're a jobbing actor. I'm like, oh, I can't because I'm doing this audiobook. So I thought, right, I'm going to get myself my own vocal booth, learn how to use Pro Tools, and work evenings and weekends so I could literally fit the work into my schedule. I'm very lucky. I'm very busy, which is very, very fortunate. So it was a needs must, really. I thought, well, the only way I can do this and to keep doing something I enjoy, which I love doing audiobooks, is to do it myself and I started by recording with a great director in the UK called Peter Rinney who I do a lot of work with I've probably done 50 books with Peter and initially he got Source Connect and we did it via Source Connect I was in London, he was in Gloucester and it worked a joy and then when I moved to Australia again we're doing it by Source Connect but then with the time difference it was quite tricky so I found the best thing to do was just to get on with it myself and it has really given me a massive freedom I'm quite proud of the fact that I'm quite self-sufficient and I kind of know in my inner ear if it sounds good or not um, or if I'm doing the right thing or not. You just know in your gut if what you're doing is good and you don't really need someone to go, oh, that, that sounds a bit off. There was a very interesting article on The Guardian Online recently about audiobook recording and the narrators were saying, oh, you know, you get so sick of the sound of your own voice, you'd listen to yourself all day and the only time you hear another voice it's because it pops into your head through the headphones saying, you made a mistake. <laughs> yes, yes, that's very true. But normally what would happen is I would send the completed chapters, I would upload it to Dropbox, the editor slash QC proofer, slash producer would listen through it and then send me back any pickups yes. that I've made, any mistakes I've made. You know, I said his instead of him or, you know, horror instead of terror, which all those little things around instead of round. There was those little annoying ones, you know. Mm. Very rarely they go, uh, it was this character that said this line, you did the wrong voice for that line. That happens very rarely, but it can happen. Obviously, when you're in a flow and you're performing and you have the he said, she said, he said, she said, sometimes I wish the author would allow us to cut them out because <laughs> uh, a lot of them seem so redundant. Yes. But you can't touch the author's work, you know. You can't make an edit yourself. So you just read it, you record it, and if they decide to cut it out later, that's up to them. Mm. Mm. I'm on record as saying that I'd love to eradicate the dialogue tags. I know. It just loses the flow sometimes because as an actor you get into this flow of, oh, I'm doing a scene. Yes, you know, that's right. And, and these characters are arguing with each other and they're having, or having a romantic scene or whatever and then suddenly it's, he said, she said, she said softly, he shouted, we know, we heard the shout. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. When there's an, an adverb attached to it, you've got to go with the adverb. But yeah, I mean, as, as a performer in an audiobook, you're doing all those different characters. So mentally, you're making that shift from character to character. And that's a challenge in itself. Because, you know, if you're performing on stage or in a film, you're just one character. And so you can stay in that character. So doing that switch from this voice to that voice. And then when you have to drop out of that as well to do the he said, it's tedious. Mm. Do you ever get lonely in your booth there? Do I get lonely? Um, no. <laughs> it's, I, as I said, I do a lot of advertising and, um, you know, maybe I shouldn't say this, but, you know, quite often I just want the creatives and the copywriters just to leave me alone. I mm. say, you've written a script, I, just let me read it. And then you get ten opinions and ten people give you, can you just emphasise the, the, a little, can you just up? And it's just, oh, for goodness sake. I like being on my own doing it. It's very meditative and contemplative for me. I'm a bit of a control freak, I suppose. I like to do it my way, <laughs> not be told how to do it by anybody else. And so far, I've had no complaints. Okay. But also, it's it's very nice sitting in a booth on your own and just getting on with it. And it's time just goes by, and it doesn't feel like work when you're on your own. I'm just feeling like I'm in bed reading a book. 
Whereas if you've got a producer in your ear, it's like you're in bed with a stranger reading a book, which is a bit odd. <laughs> Does that make well, sense? I have to, <laughs> our setup here at Square, we are myself as director engineer, I'm out of the line of sight of the narrator. So the narrator can't see me. And I think that's helpful. And certainly I try to keep my interventions down, you know, and not hit the talk back button unless there's a really good reason to, because it just breaks that flow. But I think it's fair to say, I mean, you have a huge body of experience and, and you kind of know what you're doing. But probably for a newcomer, if they were asked to self record, it would be quite intimidating having to worry about the sound levels and questions of direction and interpretation by themselves. I wouldn't advise it for a newcomer. No, absolutely. I think for a newcomer, I would not advise that at all. I think you need to have experience, a lot of experience. Don't want to sound cocky, but you need to know what you're doing first. You know, you, you... learn everything and it takes years I mean I I didn't self-record I think the first book I self-recorded was gosh when would that have been 2013 and I've been doing audiobooks in 2001 so 12 years yeah 12 years of, of, of having a producer with me. So would you um, yeah. like to tell us about your studio setup? My booth is a vocal booth from a company called vocalbooth.com, mm-hmm. which are made in Bend, Oregon. Uh, and I had it uh, made. It's a six by four foot box with a eight foot high ceiling. It's a solid wood with gyprock and foam on the inside. It's a beautiful burgundy color because I like wine. So it reminds me, of, I feel like I'm in a glass of Pino. Um, and it's got a producer's window and a door, a very heavy door. Inside my booth, I have a small screen, which has got a wire going to my iMac, which is on my desk, which is in my study, in my office, which is where the booth is in it. On my Mac, I, on my control room, I have Pro Tools. with I have, I have an Mbox Pro 3rd Gen as my preamp. Then I have a wireless mouse and a wireless keyboard, which I take in, and then I screen share into the into the booth. So everything on my desktop is now on my booth. So I can sit in my booth and I can do emails and look at YouTube and do everything. I can do everything from in my booth. It's just that I can't hear anything outside. It's my little womb. Then I have a Neumann U87, which I'm talking to you on now, which is a great mic. And then when I moved to Australia, I was encouraged to buy a 416, a Sennheiser 416 for other work. And I very, very rarely use the 416, only if I'm doing film ADR. Um, A PreSonus HP4 headphone amp in the booth. Um, And that's it. And a webcam. So I can do Skyping and stuff like that. When you were describing your uh, vocal booth, when you said it was all burgundy, I was thinking it sounded sort of, you know, in utero. And then you said how womb-like it was. So that was amusing. Yes. That Neumann mic, that's a kind of good industry standard for this kind of work. Yes. Look, it's it's not cheap. No. Um, but it's paid for itself over the years. Yeah. A lot of people would be very scared when they look at the price tag of this, but I've done audiobooks on a Rode NT2, and it could not cope with the dynamicness of my performing. I perform audiobooks. I'm, I'm an actor. I don't just narrate them. I, mm. I perform them as if I'm doing a movie. All my characters are based on actors and movie stars, and that's how I remember who I'm playing. It's like, okay, this guy's Harrison Ford, and this is, you know, Morgan Freeman, and this is this is just how I do it because I'm an impressionist. Yeah. So I, all my characters are based somewhere in voices that I've heard in the past in whether it's in the Black Adder or, or Star Wars or the Formula One or Downton Abbey, whatever it might be, whatever the cultural zeitgeist is of the day, and like that voice is in my head, I'll I'll put that into a book, you know. It's a very good hack, and I know of other people who use that, or even someone they know, you know. I commented once on a voice someone was doing for a character, and they explained they were doing their mother. Yes, oh, totally, um, but you have a, to, yeah. It's a good way of just locking it into your brain, isn't it? You've got to remember, I mean, it, you can spend ages writing notes uh, and I just think it's, what's the point just keep keep it in all in your head just have that hack have that little hook you know that quick reference I started using that hack system very very early on because I needed extremely quick mental reference and mm. it's whatever floats your boat but if you're the type of person that relies heavily on note taking and notes that will go on into years and years and years and then you will your brain will be programmed to rely on notes and I didn't want that to happen so I started because I knew that I just wanted that quick reference that quick mental you know thing I'm very fortunate in the fact that recently I'm doing a lot of new books that are 
just coming out and the authors are alive and I have asked the publishers to put me in touch with the authors. So I have been having email correspondence with the authors saying, okay, can you send me a character list of backgrounds of these characters, where they're from, what their social status is, what their gender is, what their age is, you know, what accent you see them having, etc., etc. I do a lot of fantasy novels, you know, how do you pronounce these these names, you know, these sort of Game of Thrones type names, you know, give me pronunciations. And the authors have been fantastic in in giving me all these little hooks. And sometimes I say to authors, I say, if you could cast this in the movie in your mind, if money were no object, who would you cast in this role? Mm-hmm. And they, they go, I love that. And then it makes them think, oh, I want Brad Pitt. They go, right, great. You know, but Brad Pitt doing a Scottish accent. Okay, let's try, you know. <laughs> so I get inside, hopefully get inside the author's head and, and it, it helps them to at least be happy with, with the end result. And that's really awesome to do that. Any other suggestions, uh, hacks for people who want to get into audiobook narration? Just keep keep listening and keep working and keep honing your skills and sight reading. And, um, you know, when you're reading a book in bed, read it out loud. To have your lips move, your mouth move. Just constantly be practicing, practicing, practicing so that when you get in the booth and you've got to read a script... You know, take a snapshot of the page with your eye. Don't read one word after the word. You know, I'm, I'm reading like two sentences ahead with my eyes. So I'm like knowing what's coming. And the, also the more audio books you do, the more you can actually guess. Your brain guesses the next word. It knows sentence construction so well that you don't, you just know where it's going to go. Because the more you do, the, the more you read, the more you become a master of the English language and the written word so that you just know that flow. And you can almost guess where, where the sentence is going. Do you know what I mean? Yes, I think with experience, people just become so much more fluid. And I had someone recently who she'd been reading away, reading away, and then she stumbled and she said, look, I'm really sorry. I said, don't worry, no need to apologise. She said, no, actually, I am really sorry because I wasn't thinking about what I was reading. I was actually thinking about what I wanted for dinner. And I was just gobsmacked. She'd got as far as I'm she like, had. I'm like, that's very honest. Circumstances. That's right, she was very honest. <laughs> if you want to get into audiobook narration, be a really good sight reader. I just think flow, tell the story. This might sound unfair, but I listen to a few clips of audiobooks on Audible just to see what's out there, and especially from America. And so many of them sound like droney GPS sat nav voices. And I'm thinking, how can you listen to something that really sounds monotonous like this? It just would drive me crazy. And I'm wondering if there's a conspiracy that they're trying to make audiobook narrators sound like their AI so that we're all going to be replaced by AI anyway and no one will know the difference when we get replaced. My husband subscribes to that theory. Well, there you go. So what I try and do is... Uh, is make the audiobooks a performance. And, you know, you're not going to please all the people. I've, I'll have i admit, I do go onto Audible and have a look at the reviews of my books, you know. Sorry, but I do. <laughs> and you get some people going, it really annoys me when the character whispers and the narrator whispers and the guy shouts and he shouts. Just read it. And you're like, are you serious? Mm. <laughs> I mean, what a troll. You know, if you want someone to read you a story that sounds like a GPS, go for it. That's not going to be me. I'm not, I'm going to give you... Wisp, you know, I had one guy say, oh, it's really hard to listen to your books in the car because some bits are really quiet. Like, yeah, because it's a quiet scene. Yeah. And some bits are really loud and have to turn the volume up. Yeah, because it's a battle sequence. Guess what? <laughs> you know. So if anybody wants to get into audiobooks, I would say if you want longevity in this business, be a good actor. Because if you're just going to read the book, like, sounding every every sentence has the same cadence. Yes. Da, 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 da. And you hear books where the, every sentence has exactly the same cadence. Mm. A, it's really boring. B, a computer's going to replace you. <laughs> yeah. I think that part Sorry of to be the, the harbinger of doom. <laughs> I think that part of the fashion for that in the States, because I think, yes, there is a bit of that in the States, and it came from things like This American Life and podcasting, where there was a very distinct oh. performance style of, of really sitting back on the text and, and not actually being performative. And I think that that mm. sort of um, influenced a lot of people due to the popularity of This American Life. Absolutely. So I, I think that's a really good point. So I would say anybody, just find what you do well. Find your niche. Find what your style and don't be influenced by trends in what people are listening to or liking. I think that's probably, thinking about it is probably a, a, a quite a, a good piece of advice is just stick with what you're good at. Stick with what you do. And if people don't like it, well, then tough. But 
one day someone will go, ta-da, oh, this guy does this. Following trends and trying to adjust what we do in order to please other people, I think, is, is a slippery slope because I think just stick with your guns, stick with what you do, and eventually you'll rise to the top. And I think also there's the issue of voice casting, you know, trying to find the right voice for the right content. And there might be certain types of books that you might not do because people think, no, he's not the feel that we want for this book. And that's fine, you know. That's part of the industry, you know. Well, there's nothing worse than getting a book and and the content is so unbelievably dull. You can't hide that in your voice. I, I've done a few books where I listen back and I go, God, I sound bored. And you were. Because I was. <laughs> yes, it was hideous. It was like polishing a turd. I'm thinking, this is awful. You know, but you do, you give it 100%. But even then, you listen back and go, gosh, I, I still sound like I'm not into it, you know. <laughs> and then you have to check yourself and go, okay, next time I read a book that's really, really awful, just turn up the gas a bit, you know. Uh, tell that story. Um, I have turned down a few things recently because I just didn't, they don't attract me. Yeah. I, I really need to be sort of attracted to do a book now. Again, I'm very lucky. I'm re- I'm one of the lucky ones. I know, I you know, I get offered books and I can turn books down and I'm I'm very fortunate. I love working, though. I absolutely love working. Um, but sometimes you get a book and you go, oh, I really, I don't want to do this. And you've got to sort of gently sort of say, I'm sorry, you know, it's just, and you can't say it's not my thing. You go, I haven't got any time in my schedule or whatever, you know. Yeah. Sorry, a little, little trick there. But it's, <laughs> uh, yeah, but to begin with, do everything. Say yes, yes. to everything. <laughs> you know. Do you have um, a particular narrator that you love listening to? I confess I don't listen to audiobooks. I don't enjoy listening to audiobooks. <laughs> Everyone asks, uh, people, so many people ask me, what audiobooks? I said, I don't, I don't listen. A, I don't have time because I'm too busy, but I just, I can't listen to another person read a story because I'll be sitting, there's like a busman's holiday. So when I go to the theatre, if I see a bad performance in the, in the play, it's just, just I oh, like all it takes is one person to, to just be, to not be good. And I go, oh, I'm out of the story. It's yes. broken. The magic's broken. Yeah. I can't imagine an accountant going home and really enjoying sitting on the calculator all night, you know. No. It's like, get me away from numbers, you know. Mm. No, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I just get on with it. No, look, I, I, watch, I like Netflix. <laughs> you know, I, I spend all day listening intensely, so the last thing I want to do as a form of recreation is listen intensely, you know, and people ask me what I'm listening to, what podcasts I'm listening to. It's like, <laughs> I just want to listen to the blackbird in the tree outside the window. Exactly. Exactly. I wear earphones, as you do, all day long. And when I'm in the car, I've got no music, no radio on. Uh, at home at night, it's, you know, if, 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 if I'm on my own, there's no music on. It's just, I like the peace and quiet. I like listening to the kookaburras and it's pleasant. It's, it's bliss. <laughs> <laughs> Rupert, thanks again. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, thanks. Thanks a lot and uh, good luck with everything. You can get in touch with Rupert at rupertdagas.com. You can also check him out on Instagram. Lots of funny photos there. Have a great day and I hope you can join us for our next episode. You've been listening to the audiobook podcast brought to you by Square Sound. If there's something that we haven't covered in our audiobook series that you'd like to know about, send us a message at studio.squaresound.com.au. The audiobook podcast was produced by Marianne Plaza together with Abby Holmes and Justine Sloan Lees. With special thanks to all our guest speakers, Square Sound is an audiobook and podcast studio in Melbourne, Australia. Thanks for listening.